After writing a, a book about the Negro Leagues, I wrote a book about baseball in the Dominican Republic. And then about two years ago, an editor at Beacon Press approached me about bringing these stories together and looking at what the integration of baseball meant, both for black America and the Caribbean. In the 1890s, a time of rising racial reaction, the African Americans who were playing what was then considered Major League Baseball were driven out of the league by a so-called gentleman's agreement that would keep baseball white, all white, until 1947, at least Major League Baseball. But on the other side of that racial boundary, black Americans built a sporting world of their own. And that world, centered on the Negro Leagues, uh, formed first in Kansas City in 1920. During the 30s, with Cool Papa Bell flying around the base paths, Josh Gibson hitting balls further than anybody had ever seen hit before, and Satchel Paige walking the bases loaded on purpose, telling his fielders to sit down and striking out the side, Pittsburgh became the crossroads of black baseball. Gus Greenlee, who ran a place called the Crawford Grill, took on a bunch of kids called the Crawfords and remade them into the greatest black baseball team in history, the Pittsburgh Crawfords. The islands always offered uh, black players in the United States a chance to make a living in the off season. I used to think that the Marines had spread baseball throughout the islands in Mexico. Uh, instead, though, it was the Cubans. As one uh, Dominican gentleman told me about 20-some years ago, the Norte Americanos might have been the Jesus Christ of baseball, but the Cubans were the apostles. They're the ones who took this sport and spread it to the Dominican Republic, to Venezuela, to Puerto Rico, to Mexico. In the summer of 1937, Rafael Trujillo, the state-of-the-art dictator in the Dominican Republic, sent his emissary to the United States to pick off the best black ball players to come down and play for Trujillo's team to ensure that the dictator's team would win the island championship. They first got Satchel Paige, who was pitching for the Pittsburgh Crawfords. Page went down to the islands and saw that the competition included players like the great Cuban ball player Martin de Higo, uh, the great Puerto Rican Parachin Cepeda, Orlando's father, and wired back to the United States to cool Papa Bell, his Crawford teammate. Come on down. You're going to make money. Bring Josh Gibson. Over half of the Pittsburgh Crawfords jumped down to play for Ciudad Trujillo. Other Negro leaguers played, and the Crawfords were decimated and folded within a year. Branch Rickey might have been the shrewdest baseball executive in history. During World War II, he sees all the black and Latin talent that's been off limits, and he wants it. And he focuses on a guy who had achieved a lot in sport, but not much in baseball. Jack Roosevelt Robinson, somebody who had attended UCLA where he was probably the greatest all-around athlete in the school's history, and then played a single season with the Kansas City Monarchs. Branch Rickey saw that Robinson had the ability to deal in an integrated world. He signed him to a contract. They actually had to do spring training in Havana, Cuba, because they were afraid of what they might encounter in the South. And Robinson had a phenomenal year. What Robinson? and Willie Mays and Hank Aaron bring to the game is a combination of speed and power which had never been seen. And that really radically changed how the game was played. A score of guys come into the league who win MVP awards, batting championships, stolen base titles uh, from the Negro Leagues. Uh, many of them ending up in the Hall of Fame. And ultimately, it's not only black players, but Latin players of color, who ultimately will surpass black players in their importance to the game. After 1947, uh, the doors opened to Latino players of color. And first, Minnie Minoso, Roberto Clemente, uh, players from all over the islands, but a trickle, a small number. Um, American fans largely treated them as if they were black, that 
typically American binary view of race. And now they're suddenly in a situation where they face the desperate odds of making it in the majors, but also they face racism and they face a language and cultural barrier that was difficult to overcome. By 1975, 27% of all major league ball players are black. But that's the peak. While African Americans are disappearing from baseball, Latin Americans have stormed Major League Diamonds in record numbers. There was one day in Major League Baseball in 1986 where there were eight starting shortstops who were Dominicans on the same night, five of whom had played on the same sugarcane Milltown factory team at one point. But not all of them were good enough to play shortstop in the Dominican. They were good enough to play in the major leagues. Go down to the Dominican Republic today and every single major league ball club has a full-time presence, an academy with teams entered in the Dominican Summer League, which with 3,000 players is the biggest league in baseball history. Major league organizations and agents known as Bascones corral these kids at younger and younger ages. The Bascones take advantage of loopholes and baseball policies to profit from the talent of kids who are dirt poor, enthralled by the game, and incredibly vulnerable. Those who make it, Pedro Martinez, uh, who signs for $3,500, Sammy Sosa, who signs for $5,000, who by the end of their career are making $15 to $18 million a year. Uh, many others are victimized. Fewer than 10% are likely to ever reach the majors. The histories of African Americans and Latinos in baseball have been inextricably linked for over a century. First by their mutual exclusion from the majors, then by integration. Integration cost black and Caribbean societies control over their own sporting lives. It changed the meaning of sport, and not usually for the better. Black America doesn't care that much about baseball anymore. They're far more interested in football far more interested in basketball. And I don't think that's particularly cost black America much, but it certainly cost the game of baseball.